Hello and welcome to another preview show here at Vitality Stadium. Matchday commentator Chris Temple joins me and we'll be going through everything that's gone on here in the last week. Let's take a look at what's coming up. We'll be looking back at the defeat at the King Power Stadium last weekend. We'll be discussing the new training ground which looks to be moving closer. And finally we'll be looking ahead to tomorrow's game against Burnley here at Vitality Stadium. Well, we're going to start back at last weekend and that 2-0 defeat at the King Power Stadium. Chris, it was a, a very disappointing afternoon, wasn't it? I think that sums it up perfectly. Um, yeah, the away fans who went didn't get much for their money, I'm afraid. Um, first and foremost, I thought Leicester were really good. Um, I thought they played really well. You could see they're full of confidence at the moment. Brendan Rodgers has obviously revitalised them. Um, you know, I know Wolves and Watford both won in midweek, but it, at that time, if you were back in a team to finish seventh, I would say it would probably be Leicester uh, with a bit of momentum that they seem to have built up, although they have got a bit of a tough, uh, tough run in. But yeah... As much as Leicester were at it, you know, in the opposite direction, Bournemouth just weren't. Um, yes, you know, there was a, there were a couple of key players who were clearly fatigued by international travels. You know, Jefferson Lerma had been to been to Asia. Joshua King had played two hard games for Norway, um, and you can see they weren't quite at it. Um, obviously, the squad going to Dubai adds an extra talking point into it, but I, I don't think you can make anything of that. Only the four, only four of the starting eleven actually went to Dubai, so I think that was a bit of a red herring. Um, but certainly the international, um, you know, not just the travelling, but the games and the you know, the mental exertion and everything else um, certainly looked to have taken its toll. Leicester, of course, had internationals as well. I don't think to, to quite the same extent that Bournemouth did in terms of going away. But yeah, I, th I just think that everything was flat, wasn't it? Um, it just it just didn't happen on the day. Of course, you know, Callum Wilson had a great chance early on, which if that goes in, cliche, different game. Um, but it just f f at no point in the second half did I really believe that Bournemouth were going to get back in the game, even while it was 1-0. And it, it, they did well to keep it 1-0 for a long time because, um, you know, Asmi Begovic in goal wasn't, wasn't being peppered by Leicester shots, but they had most of the possession. Um, the threat on the counter-attack from Bournemouth just wasn't there. So, yeah, all in all, it was a, it was a really disappointing day. You mentioned that Callum Wilson chance at the, in the first half. It was only 1-0 at that stage. And obviously, as you say, if it goes in, then you never know what could happen from there. And, I mean, Callum has got to score that really, doesn't he? You know, me or you to stand here already. How to stand here or left the fans to tell him he should score that he should score that you know center of the goal what was it maybe not even six yards out it's on his left foot that's the only mitigating circumstance I can find really but um, anywhere else except where he put it and it goes in um, just thought it was a, it looked a little bit sort of casual the effort I don't know if it you know it was a sort of a, he was trying to cushion it or something or whether he expected to score I'm sure all strikers given that that ball from Ryan Fraser and it was a great ball from Ryan Fraser we shouldn't overlook that um, but yeah he has to score that and. Um, you'd expect your international striker and your, your joint top scorer to, to put that away. So, um, yeah, it's not, but it's not Callum Wilson's fault that the rest of the team, you know, were equally below par on the day, unfortunately. And we saw a change in, in goal as well, Asmir Be Begovic back in the team. There was no indication before the game at all that that was going to be the case, was there? I think that was the, probably the biggest talking point of the day, really. Um, just did not see that coming. Um, you know, Asmir Begovic had, what, I think it was 22 games and then Eddie Howe decided to make a change and um, Arta Boric played the last nine. And I've got to say, it hasn't done a lot wrong. Um, I, I was very surprised to see that change made. Of course, we don't see what goes on on the training ground. Um, Eddie Howe said he has he has two number one goalkeepers, um, and therefore they're sort of, if you like, 50-50. And if one performs well in training, or um, one you know not so good in a game, but. I mean, there was one or two minor question marks about Arthur Boric for the free kick against Newcastle here. But I mean, we're nitpicking because every goalkeeper, you know, throughout the season um, will will have moments like that where you could just you know, pull their performance apart. But um, I think Arthur Boric was, was particularly harshly treated, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, Asmir Begovic probably won't want to watch the second goal at Leicester back where he came and didn't quite get there. Um, but, yeah, no, it was, it was a big talking point. And we've spoken before about how interesting the goalkeeping situation will be this summer. And I think that adds a bit more intrigue to it as to the reasons why that change was made sort of back in the opposite direction. Because Asmir Begovic was looking like, you're thinking, well, will he want to sit here and be number two next season if Arta Boric is the man in possession? Lots of time between now and then, but... Uh, yeah, no, it adds further intrigue to what might happen over the summer, goalkeeper-wise, yeah. And talking of individuals, we saw Junior Stanislas come back onto the pitch last week. That's a, that's a positive sign, that, if anything, that we can take from the game. Yeah, really good to see Junior back. Um, Well-documented problems in the past with injury. At this stage of the season, I think any player who's injured is, is racing to get back. There's only six games left now, so, um, you know, you think of the likes of Adam Smith and Steve Cook, we'll talk about later on. But for Junior to get a little run of games going into the summer, it's not just the fact that getting on the pitch, it's, it's what it gives them going into the summer as well, because then they can continue to work hard over the summer but have a little bit of a breather and it just I guess it just sort of fuels the fire for for coming back stronger and making sure they're in a good place by the time we get to August. Absolutely well earlier this week plans were revealed for work on a new training ground to begin imminently let's take a look at what Eddie Howe had to say on the matter in this morning's press conference. 
Morning, Eddie. Morning. The club <coughs> announced exciting new plans to continue with their development of the new training ground um, this week. How exciting is that for you as a manager to see that the owner was such a vision for the future? Yeah, brilliant news. Um, I think it's given everyone at the football club a huge lift, something we've been talking about internally for a long time. Um, that desperate need to continue to keep moving the club forward, to keep um, that feeling of progression internally, externally, so important. And um, yeah, the owner, uh, Maxim, uh, and the board of directors have um, done really well uh, in seeing that forward thinking. Because uh, the training ground for me is the bedrock of every football club. It's where the work happens. It's where everything you do day to day to try and get results um, comes together. So the, the main thing for me for uh, making a difference to the football club will be to the academy status um, and to try and put ourselves in a better position to produce our own players. Well, that was Eddie Howe speaking in his press conference this morning. Chris, that's some really encouraging news, isn't it, for everyone at the club? Yeah, and the, the training ground and the stadium, both the two separate entities, of course, but they do impact each other as well. Um, you know, they, they've been in the pipeline for a while and it's a lot of clubs have planned a lot of things that haven't happened. Um, and of course, here there has been one or two full storms in the past. So I think, of course, one does impact the other because the club train just alongside where we are now here at the stadium, um, which is on the land that would be used for a new stadium. So uh, therefore, until the training ground gets moved, um, the, any sort of plans and development for the new stadium can't happen. So one does knock into the other. Um, but yeah, really important. You know, you just heard the manager say it, you know, for the future in terms of bringing players through, having everything under one roof. You know, they, they do train at leisure centres and um, you know Canford and all sorts of other places around the uh, the borough um, to you know to try and bring everything together and to um, have the facilities that other clubs are able to offer players um, because when you're signing 14 15 16 year olds as well often you know facilities things like that the things they can see in front of them as well as you know the potential of the club will be a big factor so you know I just think of Southampton as an example down the road if you showed a young promising player Southampton's facilities and then Bournemouth's facilities as they stand now it's a no-brainer they, they would go to Southampton um, taking everything else out of the equation so yeah really important from that point of view um, and I just think overall it just it just gives the club you know mentally everybody at the club just it just elevates the, the status and the profile as well when you've got facilities that let's face it match the teams that you're playing you know in the league yes Bournemouth have got everything here that they they need really but on a very small scale the first team they don't really want for anything they've got everything they could possibly want there um, but you know maybe just a lack of a bit of luxury but it's by no means a shed and uh, you know a, a windy park pitch that a lot of lower league teams will be playing on the Bournemouth have had to deal with in the past when they trained over at Canford School. And one thing that Eddie Howe was big on in his press conference this morning was the ambition of the club and that's really shown isn't it with this with this development? Yeah absolutely um, you know Eddie Howe he said to me that he, he personally hasn't had a whole lot of impact in terms of the design and things as to what they want but he said that Jason Tindall has sort of on behalf of the the playing side of things had quite a bit of uh, input into to what they would like to see there so yeah it's um it's it's really good um it I guess, you know, then the, then people start to talk about the stadium once the training ground, at least the land's been bought for the training ground. So that's a that's a positive start. So that is that is a sign of intent. They've purchased the land. So it's going to happen. And now you know, the plans are being tweaked. They'll be resubmitted because the council's just had a bit of a, a reconfiguration as well. So they've got the brand new uh, Bournemouth Pool and Christchurch Council or Bournemouth Christchurch and Pool, whichever way around it is. Um, so now that hopefully that will go in and the wheels can start turning. And you mentioned the academy as well. It's something that can, can really help elevate the academy from a Category 3 status to something, either a Category 1 or Category 2. Yeah, and playing better teams, of course, is the, is the key. We've seen Bournemouth, you know, against Manchester City here in the Youth Cup this season. We've seen the under 21s playing very well against the likes of Liverpool um, as well. So the fact they need to be playing these teams every single week is is obvious for the, the development. So by elevating themselves up to Category Two and then Category One, hopefully eventually they can get themselves hopefully into the mix into the you know the Premier League academies uh, league rather than playing in the you know the, the various regional leagues they're in at the moment. So again, that can only improve players. It's one thing training alongside Premier League players every day but competing against better players every week is, is can only be helpful and of course we've seen the the academy playing in the FA Youth Cup but for Eddie Howe to have everything under one roof he can have first team training there he can have under 21s training there and for him he can you know get a, a better understanding of the the younger age groups and look at it that way as well and also you know you often hear about you know stories of you know the first team have a, a separate like roped off area there's a there's a door that uh, academy players can't go through you know it does add that little bit of sort of I guess uh, here's what you could have if you keep working hard and um, I guess uh, it's like not winning the lottery but you know it, it's, it's 
it's the, the, the one place that people will aspire to. They'll see Callum Wilson, they'll see Joshua King, Ryan Fraser, David Brooks, um, you know, players who've, who've making a mark this season. Um, you know, that, they can watch them on the training ground. So I think it's really important. And, and also for younger, you know, going right down to, you know, nines, tens, elevens, 12 year olds, they get to train at the same place the first team get to train at rather than, you know, halfway across town. Um, and again, that's hugely exciting for them. And I think that, you know, it all buys into the fact that everyone wants to be part of the, the Bournemouth story. And for new signings as well, when you're trying to get a player to come to the club, you can go to the training ground, show them this amazing complex and, you know, it can, it can be a decisive factor. It can be. I mean, I don't think anybody would come to this training ground at the moment and, and not sign because of what the training grounds are like, because as I say, they do have everything they want. The pitches are in great condition. Um, the only thing is it's, it's plonked in the middle of a, a public park. So, you, you know, you've got the black screens up and everything, which is a bit unsightly. But um, yeah, of course, if you've got a spectacular facility that's brand new and shiny, um, you know, just look at Spurs new stadium this week and everyone's been raving about that and um, what a new facility can do to invigorate a, a club and an area. Um, so yeah, no, for, for signings as well, it, it can make a, a big difference. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, they're not by no means scrimping and saving on what they've got at the moment here, but uh, it's, it's definitely it's definitely a big priority getting this training ground sorted. Absolutely exciting times indeed. Well, next up for the Cherries is the visit, visit of Burnley here at Vitality Stadium. Let's remind ourselves of one of our more memorable performances against Burnley. There's a chance to deliver across. It comes in towards the... Oh, it's deflected in! Chris Wood's going to take it. It was Westwood with the initial shot and it diverted off Chris Wood, who didn't know much about it. Completely wrong footed Begovic. And Burnley have taken the lead and some entertainment at last here at Turf Moor, albeit not in the net we wanted. No, and again, you know, Burnley have taken the lead and our goalkeeper has done a save to me because he was nowhere near that one. The way it deflected, it just spun completely away from him and he's on the floor. territory, still a chance, King's onside, left side of the penalty, shoots for goal, and Joshua King equalises for Bournemouth. What it, a goal that was. It puts him clear as the Cherries' top scorer with nine for the season, and Joshua King pulls Bournemouth back on terms here at Turf Moor, 1-1. Well, it took the Jermaine Defoe to come on and hit the goalkeeper with it, you would have fancied him to score with his, probably on his first touch, but he got his foot and got it away, but one he got it to Kingy. Let one player go flying high and just curled it into the top corner. Excellent stuff. Oh, a real mess, and now Jermaine Defoe's through. Chance to win it here. Squares it to Callum Wilson. What a moment for him, and he does find the net. Callum Wilson, it's stoppage time at the end of the season. His long wait for a goal is over, and he's going to send Bournemouth back to the south coast. With a sunny smile on their face, Callum Wilson, his teammates mob him. Delight for him and for Eddie Howe, his 100th league win as a manager. Bournemouth take a 2 1 lead. Absolutely fantastic by Callum. I've never seen so many people get up at once and are going out the stadium. I know it's, 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 it's a late goal and it's a real sickness, but they're all leaving. Well, of all the people that could have fallen to in the 95th minute of the season, ending finale, that did you mean? You know how how unselfish was he? He certainly defended. Well, goals from Joshua King and Callum Wilson there. Chris, they'll be hoping for more of, of that performance as opposed to the one that we saw up at Turf Moor earlier this season, won't they? You can say that again, yeah. I mean, the one earlier in the season, it wasn't great. The, two of the goals came in the last seven minutes, so the 4-0 was a bit of a, a false gloss. But just looking back at that game last season, I mean, uh, for Callum Wilson particularly, having waited quite a long time for a goal, having come back from injury, um, to, to nick one in before the end of the season was great. Um, for Eddie to get one over, Sean Dyche at his old club as well would have been nice, I'm sure, too. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a real positive way to, to go into the summer um, last season. Um, nice day at Burnley as well and the fans had all had a good day out and a, a nice, uh, I guess, a nice memory to take into the summer for them. Burnley have been pretty sticky opponents actually for Bournemouth um, in the, the Premier League. They're actually the last non-Big Six team to win here, um, which was way back in, I think it was November 2017. So um, they, they are, you know, we know the way that they play. They've got their, their big physical strikers, their, their Chris Woods, their Ashley Barnes, uh, Sam Vokes, of course, from, uh, from here in yesteryear. Um, so they, they play a certain way. Um, but for them, it's been a, a bit of a disastrous season 
off the back of a brilliant one last year. And they come into this game, of course, it's not been the best season, but a 2-0 win against Wolves will really you know, give them a lot of confidence. Yeah, I mean, how many times have we heard that anyone could beat anyone? I mean, Burnley beating Wolves, you know, Burnley had lost four in a row. I think Wolves are, have been absolutely flying recently, um, you know, and it seemed to get it, to get it together in the, in the chase for seventh and then Burnley turned them over. Um, so, yeah, you, you really can't quite predict what's going to happen. But, um, yeah, Burnley, uh, they've just been... I don't know quite, having not seen enough of them, but maybe the squad isn't big enough to cope with. Let's not forget they've been playing since, what, the 25th of July or something like that, when they played Aberdeen in the Europa League qualifiers. So it's been a long old campaign. I think they're 16 points worse off at this stage than they were last season when they were chasing Europe. They're only five points above the bottom three as it stands at the moment. Now, they've got a bit of a buffer to Cardiff, but they play Cardiff next week. So that is a huge game. And after that, I think they've got Tottenham, maybe Arsenal, Chelsea, they've got a tough run in Burnley. Um, so they're going to be looking at this game as well as the opportunity to put a bit of clear water between themselves and, and Cardiff um, in that one remaining relegation place. And if they, you know, if they got a result here and then beat Cardiff next week, that would pretty much be them safe. So uh, it's a huge motivation for them. Um, but from the Bournemouth point of view, you know, Eddie Howe is, is, will have been on to them this week um, about that couple of percent they've dropped. Um, moving into that sort of end of season drift that we've seen a few times before. Um, Eddie Howe said, you know, in the first Premier League season, they'd put absolutely everything into the first 30 games and did run out of steam a little bit. He actually said this morning that rather than accelerating over the line every season, they've been dribbling over the line, which I think is something that fans are starting to get a bit frustrated with. Why all of a sudden do, does the team switch off, if you like? Um, you know, consciously or subconsciously, probably the latter. Um, but yeah, so with the running they've got, you know, the one thing that's getting interesting for me all of a sudden now is the, the possibility of finishing below Southampton, which, you know, Bournemouth have been the, the top South Coast club for a couple of seasons now. Um, Southampton had a dreadful first half of the season. Um, Bournemouth had a very good one. Um, but if you compare the two now, the two clubs are in op moving in opposite directions. Southampton five points behind with a game in hand and a game at Southampton to play between the two sides. Um, that all of a sudden has got Bournemouth fans looking over their shoulder. And of course for Bournemouth, being back at home, how much of a boost can that be? We all know about the away form this season, but being back in front of the home fans, that's something they can look forward to. Yeah, and it's a proud record against the non-Big Six teams. I mentioned, of course, the Newcastle last minute goal into that net just there from uh, from Matt Ritchie. Um, you know, again, sent everybody away from here slightly bitter after the, uh, the last game. There's been some tough visitors here, but as we say, the long run against the non-Big Six teams has been impressive impressive here, um, unbeaten in, in quite a long time, best part of 18 months. Um, so yeah, and I think, the, I think the fans are owed a performance. Those that went to Leicester last week are certainly owed a performance this weekend. Um, and you know, don't forget, they're not at 40 points yet as well. I mean, they're not going to go down, but at the same time, just get to 40 points and seventh has gone now. I mean, it's a shame. Last weekend, seventh, we were stood here saying seventh is an outside possibility if everything went really well. Seventh's not going to happen now. The one frustration is that Bournemouth have lost their place in that in that neck, the best of the rest group, if you like. They're now four points off that little pocket of teams between 7th and 11th. Um, and they're sort of drifting back into the Crystal Palace, Newcastle sort of group who are in, sort of in no man's land, really. Um, so, yeah, those who say that safety is the first priority will be pleased. But I think it's a bit disappointing to having, having been in the chase for 7th all season to then not even be in that little cluster. So uh, a couple of results would be nice just to get things um, back moving. Burnley this week and then, of course, Brighton away next week, um, who, of course, uh, are bang in trouble still themselves. So they've got two teams who are going to be scrapping and fighting for absolutely everything coming up. And, of course, the 46-point mark, that's something that's, that's still realistic, isn't it? You know, getting the, the most points they ever have done from a Premier League season. 9 out of 21 was what was needed before last week. It's now 9 out of 18 available, which is still very doable, of course. That's three wins out of six games. And the fixtures, again, you'd say, are um, you know quite favourable in, in terms of that. But the points are starting to run out. So if, if um, I think they need to get something this weekend, probably a win this weekend, if they are to keep realistic hopes of getting to that 47, which, as you say, would beat the, the previous best of 46. And again, that would be a shame because that's been, that's been on for a long time. And to, to peter out and fall short of that, um, again, would be would be a disappointing way to finish, and really, when you should be finishing, you know, probably eighth, ninth, tenth on the reality of the first half of the season, it still could be possible to finish fourteenth, fifteenth, which. I don't think would reflect what a great first half of the season the team had. And just in terms of tomorrow, we've obviously got had Adam Smith out injured for, for a good while now. He's touch and go for tomorrow. We've also had Junior Stanislas and Dan Gosling back last week as well. So things are looking a little bit more positive on the injury front than they have been. Yep, great to have uh, Adam Smith back in contention. The other one I'll throw in there, not for this week, but for potentially for next week, is Steve Cook, who, I mean, he, he was pretty much told his season was over. Um, and, he you know, he... 
that no one was expecting really to see him again this season. He looks like he could be back um, this month. I mean, he'll be very keen for Brighton away next week, his old club, that would be for sure. Um, whether he's quite fit enough uh, to, to make that game, it might be Fulham here over Easter instead, but that's a huge boost as well for him. As I said earlier on about players trying to get back when the games are running out. Um, so that, that's a remarkable and it's, it's a, an amazing story really that he, you know, ended up in hospital from just going up for a header and picking up a groin injury. Um, you know, if you haven't heard the, the Steve Cook story, he got a hospital infection and, um, you know, it got quite serious for him at one point. So, um, yeah, it, it would be absolutely amazing for him to be back on the pitch before the end of the season, given what he was going through about a month ago. Absolutely. Positive signs indeed. Well, that's all we've got time for today. If you are coming to Vitality Stadium tomorrow, we hope that you enjoyed the game. But if not, make sure you keep an eye across all of our social media for the latest updates. Thanks for joining us.